again. Um, but welcome. And so today for our meeting, um, we're going to start with honoring um, Scott Whitty, who was retiring from Hope Haven. So we're going to we're going to start with that. Um, and then we're going to have a federal and state policy update. We're going to have um, a presentation on the benefits planning network. We we heard about that a few years back, but then it kind of just sat for a bit as Paige changed jobs and um, Susie and um, a lot of the benefits planning advocates have started to to bring that back and make it more um, more up to date, more active. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to also have a lot of partner updates as well. So please mark your calendars for August 19th um, and November 18th as the next two coalition meetings of this year. And we're not sure yet if they're going to be virtual or in person, but we'll keep you posted. So keep those on your calendar. So let's get started with Mr. Witty. Um, I believe that you might see <laughs> Rachel and Tony um, just brought Scott in a pan of warm bread pudding. Um, now, when you look at Scott, you have no idea that he actually has a mean side, um, which is when uh, when I've been in Rock Valley, he exposed me to um, Cedar Rock Grills bread pudding, and it is <laughs> nope. it's heaven, really. It, I've never seen anything or tasted anything better, and. Um, <laughs> I would drive just to Rock Valley for the bread pudding. Um, and I haven't had it in a long time, but Scott keeps me posted on it because he sends me pictures whenever he goes with friends and family members out uh, and they have bread pudding. He sends me pictures of lepers <laughs> and says things like, wish you were uh, retail, take lane two, retail, take lane two. Would you like me to, to, you know, would you like some, you know, kind of taunting. So we thought <laughs> instead of a cake to honor Scott, the thing <laughs> would be to share a pan of bread pudding and he has to, he has to share it with um, at least Rachel and Tony and whoever else at, 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 and your family, Scott, you should share some. Thank you for saying that, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank so you. So that was our, that was Thank you, dessert. Um, so it's hard to know the best way to really celebrate folks over Zoom. And um, when I was thinking about Scott, one of the first things I thought about was, you know, Scott was a partner since the beginning of our work. So the coalition started uh, now about 10 years ago. And Scott was um, part of the work at the very start. And excuse me, the the thing I remember early in my in, in my meeting, Scott, was that he wasn't remotely afraid of asking questions. And he wasn't afraid of of um, you know, maybe challenging um, what what what's this about and what's this intent and um, and that is a, a wonderful thing when you're a coalition because you want members to engage and you want members to share real concerns and feel safe doing that. And then the other part of Scott that's been so incredibly amazing in our work is that not only would he ask questions and feel comfortable challenging things, but he would listen. Um, he would listen to perspectives, he would discuss things, and then he would try. And I'm gonna get choked up. Um, he is uh, the quintessential partner because even if he didn't agree with you, <laughs> he would listen to you and he would try. And he has um, really, I think, moved from uh, 
someone who had a lot of concerns and doubt to building one of the most amazing employment programs with amazing staff and has some of um, just incredible employment outcomes. And uh, for all of those of you who work in rural areas, um, Scott and, and his amazing team have shown that you can, um, you can place people all over the state in, in small areas, in bigger areas, and you can do it with uh, a large number of employers. It's not just a set group of employers that you work with. And so I would say that um, they're a great model to look at. And so to thank Scott, well, first, I wanted to share that um, Scott's going to have a retirement party at Hope Haven. Um, I'm sure everybody's welcome if you want to go in person. And if you do have some bread pudding at Cedar Rock Grill. Um, but if you uh, aren't able to go in person, um, please uh, join, if you can, uh, the Zoom party. And so I've put up here the Zoom link and we're going to share these slides with you so you don't have to write that down, but it's going to be May 28th at 3 p.m. And um, it's really to celebrate those 42 years that Scott's committed um, his, his, his work and his effort to supporting Iowans with disabilities. And so we put in the chat a link to a folder that has the presentations that we have now as if we get additional ones um, as our meeting goes forward we'll throw them in that folder but you guys can access that folder and um, then you'll be able to access this link as well so in trying to think about ways to to honor scott you know when we meet in person we would always do um these what Rama would say is incredibly painful introductions, um, but it was all part of trying to get to know each other in a, in a little different way and, and start to develop relationships. And when we meant to, to all virtual meetings, um, we couldn't do introductions so easily anymore for, for a few different reasons. Our meetings are shorter. Um, and it's just a little harder to do uh, virtually than it is in person. So knowing we have a limited amount of time, I'm not going to um, have everybody introduce or, or answer a question. Um, but what I would like to do is I, I have reached out and asked um, a, a few folks who know Scott well, if they would participate um, in sharing about Scott. And for the rest of you who aren't going to participate in this section, I just want to encourage you to please put in the chat box any comments, any well wishes, any other thoughts. You'll kind of get the gist as we get going. Maybe you'll come up with other creative things you want to reflect on for Scott. But if you put them in the chat box, we'll be able to capture all those and share them with Scott. And when he's retired and he has nothing to do, he can pull those out and read them. <laughs> So, um, so I'm going to start this uh, off. I would like to um, hand it over to um, Rachel and Tony, and they will get us started, and then we'll we'll move through um, a few other folks to to really share their thoughts about Scott. Okay, so Amy gave us a list of questions to choose from, and the question that I chose was if Scott was chosen to represent your country in a global competition, what sport or activity would he be and why? And I don't know that this activity or sport truly exists, but if there was an index only typing contest, I index finger only typing, I would enter Scott Witte into that for sure. Well, I chose the icebreaker question if I could pick one song to, to describe Scott, what would that be? And I knew I had to pick something from Chicago. And first I thought it better end soon, maybe it could be an appropriate one for his retirement. But no, really I picked You're the Inspiration, which is 
a little bit of a cheesy song, but you really have been an inspiration to us and um, mentor and friend and sometimes second dad. So wish you well. Thank you, Rachel and Tony. Thank you very much, you guys. Um, Jess Cravo. Yes, thank you. If Scott Woody were a fair food, what would he be? Well, as you all know, maybe, the fair boasts over 200 food stands and um, a variety of 80 different foods on a stick. Um, but as you all know, Scott is one of a kind. So what's a one of a kind fair food? And it was really hard to come up with something even though, as you all know, I love the fair and I've been every year of my life, except last year, of course. And I came up with the fried Oreo. Let me tell you why. The fried Oreo, just like Scott, is both classic and innovative. Classic, just like the Oreo, because you're constant and consistent and you move through the world with integrity. You're innovative the fried part, <laughs> uh, because you were making changes and moving forward when not a lot of others were, and making a huge impact on lives all across your 42 years. Um, I feel honored to call you a friend, and I'll never forget the time that we traveled to Washington together, and I got to know you better. So I hope you keep texting me pictures of your beautiful grandkids and that we can keep talking about the children and watching our families grow. I love you, take care, Godspeed. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Yep, see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Denise Jewell. Oh, Denise. You're muted, friend. <laughs> muted, yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. If Scott Whitty were an animal, what kind of animal would he be? This could be dangerous, but I'll, I'll try to keep it good here. Uh, <laughs> I think he would be a Labrador retriever. And I actually did a little research on Labrador retrievers to make sure I was right. And I was right. Um, they're intelligent. They are playful. I've seen that side of you a few times. Uh, warm, friendly in their temperament. Most of the time, I'll give you that. Um, makes for an ideal first pet. Well, I think that seems to work in this situation too, because not only was this his first career job, but his only one. He's been at the same place for 42 years. So I think you were the first and long-term pet here and animal. Uh, easygoing. Um, Let's see, likes to exert high energy. I, I don't know, I, most of the time I see you, you're sitting at meetings with me, so it's hard to see that. But it also says after exerts high energy, enjoys high energy treats. I seem to remember a few times where you got more than one brownie in the bag lunches. You know, maybe, I saw one time you had like six in your bag. I don't know how you pulled that off but I saw that you had extra brownies. So you got the high energy treat. I, share, um, I shared well, though, I shared though, no, Denise. I don't remember that. I gotta be <laughs> honest. I, I, think, I think you got more than your share. Uh, loyal, <laughs> loyal on your side and also is willing to defend his owner, his, you know, where he lives and you do that and you do that well. And, you know, I, I think of you as mentor. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thanks, Denise. Sue Ann Morrow. Okay. 
My question was, if Scott was a golf club, which one would he be? And my answer is there's, you know, you have a lot of clubs in your golf bag, uh, but one that just kind of sits there quietly waiting till he's needed, it's needed, he's needed, um, is the pitching wedge. It's a virtual, it's a very virtual, versatile, good grief. That's what happens when you retire, Scott. You can't even <laughs> talk anymore. Uh, it, it can really get you out of tricky spots. It can hit high shots that can put your ball on the green with a little backspin, or it could hit these low chip shots that when you need to punch your ball into the green and let it roll to the hole. It's often considered an unsung hero, uh, not often getting the attention that it deserves. And Scott's like that in a way. He's uh, done so much for the field and didn't get or even require all the attention that he deserves. So Scott, thanks for all your work in moving our field forward, not only in Iowa, but nationally. And here's to a great, great golf game for your retirement. Enjoy it. Thanks, Sue Ann. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. Gayla Harkin. Hi, Scott. I got the task of if Scott Witte were a food in my refrigerator, what would he be? Well, I happened to clean my refrigerator last night and I opened the door and of course the first thing I saw that reminded me of you was bologna. <laughs> <laughs> I have to put that out there first and foremost, Scott, because when no matter how serious things have been, how tense, you can always laugh. You always found the bright side. And you were my piece of baloney uh, there in a meeting that I could always joke with. And uh, I, we really connected on that level. The next thing I saw was a block of Velveeta cheese. And I thought, America's processed cheese. Scott Whitty knows the process of our system like nobody else. Uh, and you've helped to change the, the system and move it in a positive way. And in, this, that's a high compliment for me, Scott, because forget Brie, forget uh, any of the other fancy cheeses out there, Velveeta, the building block of life. So and you know the process and um, it just reminded me of you. But the last thing that I saw was some goulash. And I love goulash. And I thought, well, that's kind of like Scott too, because there are all different kinds of pieces that come together to make the best goulash. And that's what you bring. You know bits and pieces about everything. You know lots about some things and you're you know, willing to take a risk and blend it all together. And so in my book, you are the goulash in our system and uh, I will miss you greatly. Um, the, some of the the off record talks that we've had have been extremely candid about how things are and how things should be and real versus not real. Uh, but we never lost, I, you never lost, and you uh, always help others focus on it, the aspiration of where we're going. So now that my refrigerator's clean, uh, I'm going to wish you the best of retirements. And like Jess, I hope that we uh, cross paths again, we stay in touch. Take care, my friend. Thanks, Gayla. Thank you, Gayla. Sherry Becker. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Scott. So Scott and I have been friends for almost 25 years. Pretty amazing. One of the first memories I have is us being at a meeting talking about guidelines for self-disclosure for people with mental illness who are wanting to work. Um, and then fast forward like 20 years later and Scott and I and a lot of people on this call worked really hard to implement IPS in Iowa after Hope Haven's success with it in Minnesota. I think Scott and I found it easy to be friends because we've always had a lot in common. Um, our philosophy has been the same. Um, we have friends in common. Scott's really good friend turns out to be a really good friend of Tim and I in the Iowa Pharmacy Association. Like who knows? You just can't get away from um, 
other people and your commonalities in Iowa. There's a long list, but we were different too. And I think our differences complemented each other. Those of you who know Scott know how detail oriented he is. And if you know me once in a while, that's enough to make me put a pencil in my eye because Scott is so detail oriented. I'm sort of big picture, but it worked for us to be really good friends that way. So as a new retiree, um, I was kind of late signing up to this party because I changed emails. So I didn't get all these great questions, but my question was if I had any advice and I'm not really sure that I do, but I will tell you what I've learned so far. I think that you and I and our work and the people we worked with, clients, colleagues, coworkers, gave great meaning and purpose to our life. I think we need to put the same effort into enjoying our retirement that we put into our career. I want you to enjoy the freedom, my friend. Your work will be long remembered with gratitude and honor. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Leanne Moskowitz. Oh, good morning. Um, congratulations on reaching this point in your life of where you're able to give a break and turn your focus back on yourself. Um, so my question um, is also, if Scott was a song, what would it be? And I thought about several things. I had an initial thought and then I thought, oh no. And you know, I really like Fleetwood Mac. And so I think Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow really encapsulates you and your life's work and your commitment to helping people have a better tomorrow. And you have really been a trailblazer in the field. You know, you went where others were feared to tread and, and into integrated employment in rural area in Iowa. And people were, you know, pretty skeptical that you'd be successful in helping people find jobs in, in rural communities. And and the outcomes that you and your team have been able to achieve for people um, over the years is just amazing and, and something you should be very proud of um, all your contributions. Uh, you know, as, as a state employee, um, I have valued your advice and your guidance as we've worked through the employment service redesign and we worked through implementing IPS in the state and, and value um, that knowledge and that experience and the wisdom that you have been willing to share along the way. And so I wish you all the best in your future and your retirement. And I hope you get to spend as much time as you want doing all the things that you love in the years to come for many years to come. So best wishes to you, Scott, and congratulations. Thanks so much, Leanne. And so our, our next one was sent to me by email because um, Linda Ferrier wasn't able to join us this morning. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna read, read Glinda's um, messages to Scott. If Scott were a song, I'd say he would be I'm a Believer by the Monkees. Some, some won't know who that is, but Scott will. This is because Scott has always believed wholeheartedly that whatever needed to be done was possible, and then he'd set out to make sure it got done. Countless people have been impacted by Scott as I'm a Believer. Therefore, he has left his mark upon the world, and his legacy lives on. She did a second one, Scott. <laughs> what is something that Scott makes look easy? Hairstyling. I miss your easy peasy haircut, Scott, and I miss you, but you will love retirement. Enjoy, Glinda Ferrier. <laughs> yeah, for, for those of you who maybe don't remember Glinda, she, she would make sure she would always run her her hand over my buzz cut. So a little weird, but that was Glenda, you know. So we only have one more. Um, 
so I, I wanted just to give a little background on this. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that we, we started about 10 years ago and we would do these introductions. And um, there were several times that our coalition meeting would um, in February would fall on or near Valentine's Day. And I remember kind of early in our work together, one of the things that we did at, as an as a icebreaker was we asked folks to give us a pitch on why someone should consider choosing them as their Valentine. And if mm. I remember correctly, um, Scott and Larry Booby <laughs> didn't seem very comfortable with that question, um, especially as some of the rest of us were slightly more intimate in our answers. <laughs> um, and so I thought it be, would be the most appropriate question to end on today. And I, I asked, um, we have a special guest that I asked to join us and help us out with this one. Um, LaVon, will you come on? Am I on? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, you're on, okay. good job. Okay, I did it right. <laughs> LaVon Whitty is um, Scott's beautiful wife. And I have asked LaVon if, if she would think about, in thinking about Scott, what would you write about why you would want him as your Valentine? Okay. I've come up with 10 reasons why I want Scott as my Valentine. Um, I'm going with the David Letterman theme, if you any wa watched his late night show. So, so here goes. Number 10, Scott cleans the kitchen very well, even though he hasn't progressed much in cooking. Lays potato chips, salted planters, dry roasted peanuts, blue bunny ice cream, Heinz ketchup, and Bud Light are some of his staples. Number nine, Scott will watch House Hunters, Lottery Dream Home, and Lakefront Bargain Hunt with me, even though he prefers the Voice and Fox News. Number eight, as a family, he's taught us all how to love football, basketball, and baseball. He was quite an athlete in high school and even college. Although when watching the Hawkeyes on TV, Scott, Seth, and myself have been known to watch in separate rooms to give Scott his space to coach, reprimand, and cheer on his team. He's quite competitive. Number seven, Scott is very witty in more ways than one. I asked his grandson, Calvin Scott, why he loved grandpa. And he said, because he tells him jokes. Not recall hearing Scott ever tell Calvin any jokes. I asked him what it was. Cal said, why did the cow go to school? A, B, C, D, E, F. Moo. So on second thought, maybe he really isn't that witty. Number six, Scott puts a lot of thought into what he's going to say. He's been known to have time run out on the voicemail before he's finished leaving the message. Number five, Scott is a per perfectionist, whether that's at work, mowing the lawn, or matching the right color socks to his pants. He is the perfect Valentine. Number four, Scott is quite handsome. Even if that long, blonde, bleached out hair that I first noticed 45 years ago has now become a butch that I buzz to his perfection every three weeks, thanks to COVID. Scott takes me on many dates, number three. Our regular dates are to the car wash, the dump, the gas station, and most recently the grocery store on Monday nights because it's cheap milk day. Reason number two, Scott thoroughly enjoys his newest title earned in 2016, Grandpa, Grampy, or Gramps. Skylar Grace said she loves Grandpa because he plays with her. You can find grandpa pushing the kids in the swing in the backyard, going down the slide with them on the playground next to our house, or trying to put the puzzles back together after they go home. 
I asked Bo and James why he loved grandpa and he said, yes. And I know Hattie Sue loves grandpa because they share the same birthday. And the number one reason why I want Scott as my Valentine is, Scott is a wonderful husband, father, and grandpa who not only loves us, but loves the Lord. Oh, nice. Thank you, Lavon. Thank you, dear. You better share, Thanks, dear. You better share that bread pudding with her. <laughs> I don't know. Thank it's kind of so small. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I love you. Oh, I love you, too, Scott. Even though you drive me crazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were you were you on when somebody said I was a good listener? Yeah, I kind of laughed. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> it wasn't 10 reasons why I don't want you as my Valentine. <laughs> oh, I want to thank everybody um, so much for their participation. And, um, and I so appreciate uh, Scott. And I think you all did a beautiful job of highlighting um, some of the contributions uh, and, and some of the, the wonderful assets that Scott Whitty has brought to our partnership and our work together. So um, please join if you can uh, his Zoom. I want to thank those who were retired who came back and joined us today. It is so good to see your faces. And I think we better move on to policy. Um, so thank you all so much. And I am going to turn this over to Julie Christensen. And feel free to continue to put any um, well wishes to Scott in the chat if you want. And we'll capture those at the end and share them. So thank you all. I just want to go on record that when I agreed to do this, it was not with the knowledge that I had to follow up on all things Scott. and. That is so unfair. So first I will say, Scott, I am on behalf of myself, I so appreciated when I first moved to Iowa, you were one of the first providers that intentionally reached out and you know, helped me understand the dynamics of being a provider in the state of Iowa. And I'm so incredibly grateful for that. Um, and I'm so incredibly unhappy right now to have to follow all of that with talking about congressional shenanigans. So I'm just going on the record. <laughs> well, thank Anything. you, Julie. We're Iowa. Your time in Iowa w was great, but, but now to have your experience in Iowa and representing some of that in your current position, that's incredibly important for us as a state. And, uh, just appreciate all of your work. Learned a lot from you and continue to, and, and hope there's still opportunities to continue to moving forward. All right, huh. on to congressional shenanigans. <laughs> um, I, let's see, where to even begin? Um, I'm just gonna give a couple of highlights of kind of the big picture stuff. Um, and I did send these slides to Amy and Jess so they can send them out to all of you. All of the links are active. So feel free to dig in and um, whatever and, and ask questions. You guys know how to find me. Um, right now, all things Congress is infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> there is not a whole heck of a lot else going on right now, um, but it is worth noting that the infrastructure package, um, which is both the American Jobs Plan and the Families Plan, you may have heard it called different things, is a combined approximately $4 trillion investment um, that is using a really broad definition of infrastructure. That's, that's part of the debate that's happening right now in um, Washington, D.C. We typically think of infrastructure as, you know, roads and bridges. Um, but we certainly over the, the, the pandemic time have come to appreciate that there are other aspects of society that really are infrastructure issues. Um, so whether that's child care or elder care, um, home and community-based services, um, addressing um, 
broadband <laughs> has become a major issue. So no, that's not a bridge you drive over, but it's still a critical piece of the infrastructure of how we focus as a society. Um, and so this package is big, um, yet to be seen how Congress is going to move forward with this. Um, but what what's critical, I think, is, you know, regardless of your political persuasion, um, I think we can all agree that the Biden administration has set forward a very clear agenda about thinking about the needs of all Americans, um, including people with disabilities, which we have not always had front and center within a, um, you know, presidential administration. Hi, Minnie Jess. Sorry, I'm easily preoccupied. <laughs> Um, so lots to happen here. What is likely happening, and because I did my slides in advance, I actually sent them last night, I now don't remember what's on them. So <laughs> bear with me as I go through these. Um, so right now, the, the focus is to do as much as possible in a bipartisan manner. That is President Biden's um, call to all members of Congress and across his administration. Um, where there is an anticipation that any moment now there will be a counter off from Republican leadership. Um, certainly we're hearing, and I put progressive in quotes, I don't even know that that's a fair description, but it seems to be what the media folks have coalesced around, but the progressive Democrats are urging leadership to basically ditch bipartisan efforts, um, and which is not helpful. <laughs> the grand scheme of things, but, but there we are. Um, so, you know, I, I always, say I am a fierce, independent, and an equal opportunity critic of both sides of the aisle. Um, we'll see where we get with this. Uh, what is being looked at right now is where is their agreement? Um, so what, what piece of this $4 trillion package can be parsed out um, in a bipartisan manner to move forward in regular order? Um, Democrats are also exploring what can be accomplished through the budget reconciliation process, which requires um, only a majority, not the, the two thirds. Um, so, you know, where they're looking at that. And the latest word from the White House is do whatever you can quickly in a bipartisan manner, get that done. And then we have time to argue about the rest of it. So <laughs> we'll kind of see where this all lands. But a couple of things that we do know are being looked at, um, a surface infrastructure package is very likely to proceed. So that is your traditional roads and bridges. Um, it's something that um, all members of Congress, regardless of what side of the aisle they sit on can kind of understand. Um, so that's pretty low hanging fruit. Some of the other pieces, um, including um, larger investment in HCBS, which is something we're really paying attention to, but also broadband and childcare and all these other things they're going to be looking at. Um, the other thing that is happening in kind of a parallel manner, um, not included in the broader infrastructure package. Um, but we all know that there has been for a long time a need to reform Social Security. Um, we're not in a position to do the full range of reform that is, is needed, in, but there are a couple of things that have been very close in um, the past Congress to getting pushed across the finish line. Um, and at least now the, um, the word from Congress is that they can do a partial reform through budget reconciliation. Um, so again, this only requires a 50% majority, well, 51% majority of the Senate rather than the two thirds. Um, so there will be more information coming out in the next couple of weeks. They wanna move this very quickly over the summer and they're ironing out the details. But um, in a briefing um, yesterday, the things that are on the table for social security reform um, as part of this or SSI reform is um, raising that monthly maximum. So the 794, for those of you who are wonky in the weeds of SSI, um, raising that maximum to um, the equivalent of 100% the poverty of poverty level, raising asset limits, uh, removing marriage penalties, um, eliminating the income exclusions, um, and eliminating in-kind supports and maintenance. So that's going to be more to some of you than others. <laughs> but broadly speaking, these are things that um, we've been advocating for as kind of low-hanging fruit and easy, um, 
improvements to social security that it looks like there's a path to move forward over the next couple of months. More information to come on that. Um, SSDI is also being looked at, but that's a different process and not um, something that they feel they can move through reconciliation. So it's going to take a little bit longer um, because we're not gonna really move any large packages through Congress until infrastructure is sorted out. Julie, can um, I ask a question? Yeah. Regarding, because I don't want to through the extent the weeds of all this, because I, I think this is I, this is just my my kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but I'm weird a lot of ways. When we're looking at look at eliminating the income exclusions, uh, would that be replaced with any other type of work incentive? Or because um, many of these I see as being pro returning people to work, but the eliminating the income exclusions is there more to what that will look like in reality? Like, would that be replaced with some other type of exclusion? Or I'm just curious, is there a plan with that? So the quick answer is, I don't know, and I'll get back to you. Sure. Um, but the less quick answer is that right now, the, um, the information that is being shared is being shared with um, the advocacy community. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has been, the messaging has been really focused on the end paycheck in the hands of an SSI recipient. Um, to your point, there is going to need to be some clear guidance um, and some thought in behind this as this moves forward and what that'll look like. Um, but that level of information has not been shared okay. publicly. All right. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, <laughs> I, I am sad to report in some ways, um, that WIOA reauthorization is moving forward. Um, this was something that had been um, kind of kicked around over the last couple of months. Um, it is going to move forward because it's a high priority, both in terms of workforce in general, um, but also because WIOA, um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, sorry, I'm bad with my acronyms, was a strong bipartisan piece of legislation when it was, um, crafted and um, moved forward in 2014. So um, there is a desire to take on a major piece of the work that can be done in a bipartisan manner. Um, at this point, what we know is that the House um, is, has, the House has actually formally started the process. They had their first committee hearing last week um, on youth employment. Um, I am, quite frustrated that youth with disabilities was not included in any way, shape or form in that hearing. Um, and in yelling at some of my, truly they are my friends, but sometimes I, I have to yell, um, not at them, but around them, um, the, the staffers of the Education and Labor Committee, the concern in including um, youth with disabilities in that hearing was the broader conversation about whether or not Title IV is going to be taken off the table for WIOA um, reauthorization. And it, it was thought to open Pandora's box. Hold that thought because I see confused faces. I'm gonna say more about that in a second. Um, but as of right now, the House is saying they are moving forward but they will not touch Title IV. The Senate, is less clear, um, but unfortunately, the most recent information um, received in a call um, with Senate staffers last week was essentially asking the disability advocacy community, um, you're gonna have to prioritize and negotiate. So what do you want? Competitive integrated employment, pre-ETS, 14C, pick one, you're only gonna get one. Um, and you know the advocacy community very quickly responded and said, yeah, no, <laughs> we're not picking one. We want all of them. Um, so, uh, so there we stand. Um, in terms of APSI's position, um, and we do have formal comments that are available if anybody wants them, uh, we oppose reauthorization at this time for a couple of specific reasons, um, primarily having to do with uh, there has just not been time to fully implement WIOA, and then there was a pandemic in the middle of things. Um, and so there hasn't been the level of oversight um, and investigation into what works and what doesn't work for us to be able to reauthorize in a way that we can feel confident is going to be true improvement. Um, and, and so that's the primary reason we are, um, that APSI is opposing reauthorization. Um, however, 
it's happening. <laughs> so since it is happening, where APSI's, um, APSI has now pivoted in terms of our communication with the Hill is that we are absolutely opposing any changes to Title IV, which is the Rehabilitation Act pieces. That's where the CIE definition is, PREETS, Section 511, which is limited on the use of 14C and subminimum wage. Um, we are absolutely opposing any reopening of that title. And if we're going to do work on the other three titles, we want to be at the table and look for more opportunity for there to be intentionality around serving people with disabilities um, through other pieces of the legislation. So that's what we know at the moment. <laughs> this is a quickly evolving process. Um, and it also impacts 14C negotiations as well. I'm just gonna pause real quick because I can only see like six of you to make sure there's no hands raised or, or questions. Okay, oh, I see one. Um, yes, hi. Um, I just have a quick question. Hopefully it's a quick question. Um, when you say enhanced language, can you specify what you mean by that? Yeah, and that's probably a bad term. Um, and that's what I get for trying to do work late at night, the night before. Um, truly in titles one, two, and three, there is next to no mention of people with disabilities. Um, and so that what we're really looking for is the opportunity to look at um, broadly workforce development activities that are overseen by Department of Labor, apprenticeship programs, um, you know, all of these pieces and parts. Where is the language within WIOA to ensure that people with disabilities are included in that? Um, so that's really what we're talking about. Same thing with adult education and literacy under Department of Education. Um, and um, the Wagner-Pazer Act, um, you know, your, your employment services, your, I, know, I don't know what to call them anymore, but your workforce. <laughs> uh, the America's Job Center's thank basic you. workforce services, absolutely, yeah. I don't want to call them one stops. <laughs> um, we're still okay with one stops. I mean, we're not supposed to be, but you know, this, there's things that we're called we really don't like. One stop is okay. Um, okay, thank you for that permission. We, we've been called um, a lot worse, um, yeah. But it would be great if it could truly be a one stop for everyone, right? <laughs> so, um, so that's that's what we mean by that. Does that help, Lene? Yes, I think. Um, I guess the way that I understand the Title One program, I feel like there is um, a good amount of language that talks about including persons with disabilities. Title Two and Title Three, I definitely. This is the first time I have not gotten asked to speak at an IC. Um, title, uh, title two and title three, I definitely agree with the enhanced language, but title one, I guess is what I was looking more of the clarification on. So thank yeah. you. You answered that for me. Thanks. Yeah. And, and agreed. There are, there is mention, um, of disability. There's also a number of bills that are being introduced now, particularly around apprenticeships, um, that are attempting to strengthen the language around disability. So, you know, listing disability in a long list of, you know, um, populations that are targeted is not the same as holding labor accountable <laughs> for, you okay. know, measuring and ensuring that that's actually happening. Um, so that's the other piece of the conversation for Title I. So Julie, if I'm hearing you correctly, beyond just the language of saying person, certain persons with disabilities is a priority, you want a more specific maybe outcome measures or things to be integrated into those sections. Am I understand, does that sound kind of what you're looking at? Broadly speaking, with the okay. caveat that um, at least from APSI's position, mm -hmm. um, we, are going to want the Brian's of the world at the table helping us. Really are there more? Are there more of me? I would love someone to hang out with. Um. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, at this point in the game, you know, sure. as a national organization is, sure. is kind of as a broad sweep saying, look, you say you're doing this great, then game on. <laughs> we want to look at every aspect of titles one through three and make sure we are we have as much in there as we can to help people with disabilities.
No, that makes sense. But just because I, I haven't taught it for a little bit, the fact that you said Brian's plural, I know my friend Lene was panicked that there may be more than one Brian out there. So oh. um, thank, you for, thank you for saying that, though. <laughs> you said it. I didn't. <laughs> There's only, there's only one of you, you're a one of a kind. So in terms of 14C, um, it, this has been the start stop agenda item of 2021. Um, I, I know we have mentioned on the last call, the introduction of the um, Transformation to Competitive Integrated Employment Act, um, which is the phase out of 14C as a standalone uh, bill with, um, targeted funding for providers and states to help with that transition. Um, that has only been introduced in the House. The Senate keeps promising. Um, I actually got an email from a Senate staffer yesterday that started with, I know, I know you've heard this before, but really we mean it this time. <laughs> the, the intent is to um, introduce their version of the bill in early June. Um, the holdup has originally was lack of a Republican co-sponsor. Now the holdup is because of a bunch of other pieces and moving parts, including um, the Biden administration um, adding a $2 billion funding piece to phase out 14C as part of the American Jobs Plan. Um, then add in WIOA <laughs> and the possibility of reauthorization. Um, and there have been ongoing conversations about whether 14C phase out um, really should be included in those negotiations. So all of that to say there are a number of different pathways currently to bills um, introduced, um, but neither of them moving at the moment. And we are not even really pushing on the advocacy front because it's not clear which delivery item we are pushing for, um, other than we do support the phase out of 14C. Um, in the meantime, we've really been focusing on supporting states. Um, so 13 states introduced um, 14C elimination legislation this session. Uh, Washington state's bill passed, so they are now the sixth state. Um, to phase out 14C. And then Hawaii and Colorado are both super close. And there's a couple other states that um, seem to be getting some momentum. And, and now, certainly at this time of the year, and, and you guys know this intimately since your session just ended, um, depending on where you are, you might be up against, we might be up against a timeline in terms of what can move forward um, this year. But lots of stuff moving on the 14C front. Um, I, that's pretty much it for me. Um, I included in the slide deck, these are the bills that APSI supports and um, a list of things that we're monitoring. We do um, anticipate that the SSI Restoration Act is going to be introduced shortly. Um, that's the piece I, I mentioned earlier that can go through budget reconciliation. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. And everything else in the slide is just an update on what these bills are. And as of a week ago, the status, um, what committee it's in, so on and so forth. Um, also in the slide deck is a um, list of minimum wage, 14C minimum wage and other employment first bills um, that we've been tracking and, and doing our best to support as a national organization. The ones in yellow are the ones that have passed into law this session. Um, so things are moving and shaking in the disability employment arena across the country, um, but still lots to do. Shameless self-promotion, if you haven't already, please join us at our annual virtual APSI conference. Yay. Okay, that's it. That's all I got. Oh, Julie, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Julie? All right. Thank you so, so much, Julie. That's great. Early... Uh, early in our meeting, I put a link to Google Drive and Julie's presentation slides are in that folder that you can access as well as we'll send them out to everybody in, in the notes too. Oh, thanks, Jess. <laughs> it's way more adept at that than I am. Um, all right, so now we're going to go to Amy Campbell, who's a lobbyist and 
who also um, works with the Iowa Developmental Disabilities Council and has generously offered to give us a state uh, policy update. Thank you, Amy. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I'm gonna share my slide. It's not as nice and pretty because we ended session last night at 11.45. So um, it was three days of 18 hour days. So it was a long, I, if I look a little tired, I am, cause I'm not, I'm operating on um, caffeine and frustration, I guess, probably as well. So. Um, I was glad to see that things are happening nationally on employment because um, I'm not sure I have a lot to report on the house side or on our state side, but we'll give it a shot. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen if that's okay. Um, if I can figure out what happened to my, hmm. I don't know where it's at. Um, well, let me try my desktop and see if that works. Totally, we can see it. You're able to see that? Okay, good. Yes. Well, I did just put it together this morning, so hopefully um, I'll go through it pretty quickly and then I can answer questions. But I am, I appreciate you having me. I know it's been a couple years, I think, since I've been here. Um, I'm kind of pitch hitting for Brooke and Bill at the DD Council. Um, a lot of you know that I write InfoNet and I'll be trying to do that this weekend, but realistically, it'll probably be. Um, early next week because I have three kids with two Irish dance competitions, four soccer games and a 5k run. So I don't know that I'm going to fit it in this weekend along with a graduation party. But um, but uh, hopefully I, by the end of today, our bill tracker and I'll show our, our website um, link at the end, we'll have all of the status and everything updated. So if you do want to know what um, ended up passing or how what it ended up getting included in a bill, it'll be there. Um, just in general, I think there was a pretty good aggressive um, uh, agenda kind of outline, uh, out, uh, laid out by our um, Republican controlled House, Republican controlled Senate and a Republican governor. And I think everybody thinks that when you have the trifecta of everybody being in one party, you think that they're all gonna agree. Um, the reason we're 19 days late in adjourning is because there was basically a family feud going on between the House and the Senate. It was open, it was angry. Um, if you go back and look at any of the floor debates in the House, um, they are constantly jabbing the Senate and others in the Senate are constantly jabbing the House. So it was pretty painful to watch um, them not be able to agree to almost anything. Um, you know, throughout session. So a um, couple of things that they did do, there was a big focus on child care this year. So they were able to make some of the governor's recommendations on child care to make it more accessible to individuals. Um, they increased the number of the income level for child care tax credits. Their um, child care assistance at the state, once you earned a penny more, uh, over the el eligibility level, they would drop you off entirely. Um, so now they're going to kind of create a little bit of an off ramp so that you gradually um, come off of that assistance so that there's incentives for people to advance their careers. Um, they've given some jobs, uh, 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 some businesses that are getting state assistance to um, extra points in their applications for state assistance if they have on site daycare. Um, that was the preferred method of doing that rather than giving funds to businesses to actually jumpstart or provide daycare for their provide for their folks. Um, there were, as you heard earlier in the session, a number of real restrictive voting changes, which I do believe are going to impact individuals with disabilities and their families and their caregivers. Um, you're going to have to be really careful about who handles ballots now. Um, they have made it a felony if you give it to a neighbor to go drop it into the mailbox. Um, a class C felony. If you take a stack of mail from your neighbors that includes their ballot and drop it into the mailbox or take it into the county auditor's office, only a person who is in the, lives in the household or is an immediate family member can do that. 
they did add something last night um, in the middle, like really late in the process, like at about nine o'clock last night, they added language that would allow um, a person who has a physical or they say blind um, or visual disability um, would be able to sign a form that's already prescribed. Um, they'd have to sign this form and submit it that they want to have somebody else deliver their ballot to them. Um, we made a number of comments during all of the public hearings that Iowa, Iowa nice, we trust our fan, our neighbors and our community members, our church members to help us out in this world. And, um, you know, some of that includes if they're going to the post office or they're going downtown, can you take my ballot with you? Some people might trust their neighbor a lot more than they trust their family member, um, taking their, their ballot. <laughs> in. So. Um, I think that's um, maybe something that's challenged. It's gonna be really tough to, to vote from home now. You're gonna to have to be right on top of it in submitting your requests because you now will only have 20 days to submit the request, get that turned around and sent back to you, then mail it in. It has to be received by election day now. Before it just had to be postmarked or enter into the system by, by election day or the day before election day, this now has to be received in the office by the end of election day. Um, it's a hard cutoff. So that's really gonna be challenging. They made some other changes last night, allowing some counties to deny requests for satellite voting stations. Um, so like in the public libraries, if they don't feel like they have enough staff to do it or it would cost too much, they don't have to. I don't know that any county auditors are talking about doing that, but it's a possibility. Um, so that those changes are pretty significant. And I think anybody that works with individuals with disabilities is gonna have to know these new laws. And certainly the DD council will be working on trying to get that information out so that everybody knows if they wanna vote early, they're gonna have to really be on top of it in order to do that. Um, some other things, there was all kinds of fighting over vaccines this year. Um, there are people in the legislature who fully believe that vaccines are bad. Um, and so they did, the one thing they did end up passing was that you can't have a government ID that is a va vaccine passport. And businesses cannot require um, their, their employees or the people coming to their business to be vaccinated. Um, but that does not apply to healthcare, nursing home, long-term care, hospitals, um, those. Um, we tried to make food bank um, with all the food pressures on food insecurity right now. They um, made food banks exempt from taxes um, and then last night, you probably read in the news this morning, the governor signed just after midnight, um, a bill that no longer requires or no longer allows schools to have mass mandates. So, um, you know, I know that at least my kids teachers are not very happy about that, but, um, no mass mask mandates. And then also cities and counties cannot pass local ordinances that require people or businesses to have a mask mandate um, and unless it's you know, they can do that for their own local government like the county courthouse or the the property that the, the city and county owns they can but not for any private businesses and i want to note that this is not just for covid this is for any reason so one of the legislators who happens to be a law professor said so anthrax a gas leak another pandemic, the flu, and whatever, they can't require a mask mandate for any reason. Uh, of course, there were the other things that were not very, um, that were caught a lot of profile this year, that guns, you know, carrying it without permits. There was an abortion constitutional amendment that passed last night, the tax cut bill, there was a significant um, police um, support of the police, they called it the back to blue bill um, they allowed charter schools, but not the, how, the vouchers for private schools this year, but more focused on um, some of the things that we track for the D DD Council. Um, there's support for independent living. There was quite a bit of things that you could kind of put in that category, 
And I think it was a real focus this year of everyone, given what's going on with Glenwood, the need that um, DHS will have to show that we have, you know, good investments in home and community-based services around the state so that that gives people options to live in their own communities and communities of choice. Um, very significant increase in HCBS provider rates, um, 18 million total. So 7.1 million of that, it goes to HAB um, providers and 11 to uh, the rest. And this is in addition to um, the 10% increase if the DHS applies for that, um, the Medicaid increase that I think is two years, at least two years maybe, um, they, they can apply for um, through the, the federal um, relief funds. Um, there was a $2 million home health provider rate increase, um, an increase for voc rehab that um, to help draw down additional federal dollars. And I think they got a few more FTEs, I don't, or uh, employee slots um, in that. Um, a lot of stuff that people have been tracking, I think every health group and, and social services group was tracking um, telehealth payment parity. Telehealth services went up 411% last year. Um, that's not surprising. So um, it was a top house priority to get telehealth payment parity. So regardless of how you deliver a, a service to a person with a mental health condition, um, it would have to be paid equally. And that is for commercial plans that the state regulates. So those um, self-insured big plans that are regulated by the federal government, that would not apply to them. It does apply to the state um, employee plan, um, but it does not apply to Medicaid. And I think the reason they exempted Medicaid is that would have a big cost to the state. And they think that the fed federal government's going to continue that anyway. So they didn't want to kill a bill um, when they knew something was going to happen on that front anyway. Um, they did have back money for public transit. They only got a 1.5 million from the state, but they did get a, I think, a big increase on the federal side. Um, they more than doubled the funding for um, affordable housing and homeless programs that go through those local housing trust funds. I know like in areas like Polk County where we have really high cost housing, that's really important to the, um, uh, the population um, that, that is served by the MHDS region to be able to get those housing and homeless programs funded. Um, there was a, um, you know, you heard this on the federal side, broadband and infrastructure. We put in $100 million of state money to start buying, um, expanding out high speed internet throughout Iowa. Unfortunately, they're not talking about affordability yet. It's all about speed and availability, not affordability on that side. So I think that is something that is going to be need to be addressed in the future. Not everybody can afford that eighty dollar, ninety dollar bill that you get. Um, and not always does it mean if you have Mediacom that you have the best service, even though technically on the on the page, um, I'm kind of surprised mine's hanging in there this morning. I've had some real difficulties with mine here in Johnston. So, um, I know there's some efforts on the ABLE um, savings accounts on the federal level, but here at the local level, we allowed the ABLE, um, people that have those older uh, supplemental needs trusts um, and special needs trusts to convert those to ABLE accounts, which are more flexible, doesn't require a lawyer to go through it every time you wanna spend something. And then they also protected it from Medicaid estate recovery, which is a significant um, piece as well. Um, so there's a real big effort to try to make those accounts more available and not notable for um, individuals who um, have disabilities. The, um, I know maybe some of you are on here were involved in the adult changing stations. Um, we started off pretty small trying to at least get them in our DOT rest areas. The bill did not pass, but only because the DOT put the money in in their budget and said, we're gonna do it. So I think there's a step two coming um, on state buildings. I know that there's a group that's already organizing wanting to get those adult changing stations in like the state capitol. Um, so I think um, where you have family restrooms, I think it's an easier spot for that. 
Um, unfortunately, the Capitol's restrooms aren't all that accessible to begin with, so we might have some difficulties with that. But I'll talk about the MHDS regional finance, the funding changes here in a second. But while on the negative side, the governor did sign a bill that prohibited cities and counties from passing local ordinances that would um, prohibit discrimination based on how you pay your rent. Basically, they don't want to have to rent to people using the housing choice voucher, um, the section eight vouchers. I, I quite honestly can't fathom that since that's a, a you know a really reliable source of rent. But um, they there were three communities where they had troubles with landlords, so they passed local ordinances, and they will not be allowed to do that anymore. I, they, they the ones that have it phase out, I think, over three years, but no other ones can do that. Um, and just a note, nationally, I don't know what Iowa's percentages are, but nationally, a third of the people using these have disabilities, and a third are el are older, elderly. So two thirds are either elderly or have a, or a younger person with a disability um, that use those, those vouchers. Um, legislature continued on a path toward trying to secure more children's mental health services. So $3.9 million for psychiatric medical institutions for children, a million to take some more kids off the children's mental health waiver waiting list. Um, that does not clear it. Um, that, you know, as we take kids off, more people apply because they, you know, there's the, the demand is far exceeds the number of kids that are actually on the waiting list. And then another million dollars to um, the school based mental health services. Um, there was also another 2 million added for those therapeutic classrooms um, that were passed last year for kids that have behavioral issues. Um, and then the big change, of course, this year, we had a massive tax bill um, that um, had a lot in it. And my business partner could tell you a lot more about it. But um, the piece that I was looking at was, of course, the mental health and disability services regions change. <clears throat> they didn't change what the services, what services are provided or how they're provided, but they did change how the system was funded. Um, and for the first time, they actually, they, I, I shouldn't say the first time they listened, they did set this up to be a standing appropriation, which really actually means they don't have to go through every year and put appropriate the money. They can, however, go in and say and change it to lower the amount. But th that the good news is it's automatic unless they go in and change it. Um, so they would have to take action to lower or increase it. Um, so that's a little bit of good news. I mean, it is a little bit more stable than what you um, have seen in the past proposals, although still dependent entirely on the state service, uh, state funding. Um, so it's a two year phase out starting this July. So beginning this July, by the middle of this month, or of June, just in a few weeks, the all of the counties are going to have to recertify their budgets and submit them, and they will have to all have all of their pooled money in a single account by July one, which I think is going to be quite, pretty challenging for regions to do. Um, just, I mean, I'm not saying you can't, but it's tax dollars, you know, moving into a, a combined account. Um, I think anytime you do that, it takes lawyers and other things that you have to work out. Um, so they do have to have that done by July 1. And then this year, the state's going to pick up 2114 per capita and, or I'm sorry, 1586 per capita. I put that in there wrong. And 2114 county, should say county there. Um, so that equals $37 per capita. You'll remember that it's 4728 per capita right now. So there are some that will be, this is not gonna be sufficient funding for, and others that it will be. Um, one of the things they're doing is trying to force regions to spend down those ending fund balances that they have. So in fiscal 23, it goes up to 38 per capita, then 40, then 42, and then they um, have a automatic, automatic increase 
um, attached to that. Unfortunately, the increase is up to one and a half percent, but it's tied to how much the sales tax increases from one year to the next. So if we ever end up with a, a down economic year, when you might see mental health services in more demand, you're not gonna have any increase in the funding. So that's a little tricky to have it tied to that, but as legislators said, oh, we got five years to fix that. So <laughs> that might be something that they're looking at. Um, there is an incentive fund set up. They put in $3 million for this next year. Um, and that is funded um, with $3 million. And then regions are allowed to have 40% ending fund balance this year, 20% in 2023, and then 5% after for cash flow. Probably not good enough cash flow for small regions. They're going to have to figure that out. Um, but a larger region probably could make that work. Um, but the regions are gonna get their money quarterly, probably another challenge. If you can't use any other funds in the county, I don't think services tend to be divided up in four equally throughout the year. Um, so that could be challenging, um, but they are, I think DHS is gonna try to work through that, but if you are over those ending fund balance amounts there, any amount that you're over gets withheld from your quarterly payments and put into the incentive fund. So that incentive fund could be much larger than the 3 million, um, especially this year when you have regions that have higher amounts. The reason they went to performance-based contracts is that is working out well in a couple of regions where they have performance-based contracts with their providers. However, um, that's kind of their control to make sure regions just don't go out and spend like crazy to get their fund balances down, um, to take away that in incentive to do that. Um, and so uh, those will be key things in how DHS puts together those, those performance-based contracts. And they know they're gonna have to ease into that there's also going to be reporting required for, of regions and then a study this interim on the efficiency of each region. So it'll be a region by region review of how efficient they are in meeting their service requirements, not their performance, but their service requirements. And that's in direct um, response to some regions having like Polk County a $60 per capita budget with, you know, not enough money to spend. So they want to make sure that they're being as efficient as they can with those with those funds. So I know that's a lot, but I'm trying to keep everything updated on our website um, and up there. It is a new website. It looks a little different, but um, we have um, our bill tracker is up on that and we'll have our new uh, issue, our post session issue up probably in another, oh, probably by Monday or Tuesday. So. I know that was a lot. Sorry, threw it all out there. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Bill, I know that you had a couple of questions. Do you want to go ahead and ask Amy? Yeah, I can do that if you want. I put it in the chat. Amy, I, I have people that come to me about the trust issue. And all I keep hearing is some older trust. What exactly does some older trust mean? <laughs> yeah. And I have one more question, but go ahead with this one. That one is the special needs trusts and the yeah. supplemental needs trust. So it doesn't matter how, when they were created, like a, a date. It's just a, it's an older model of trust, I guess. So it could have been okay, created. It's, it's, a lot of folks are confused by that. And, you know, for example, Kyle's trust isn't really set up yet. It won't be till I pass away, which probably be a good day for everybody, <laughs> for some people, but um, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but it's for trusts that may have been, you know, maybe one parent or a grandparent set up in the past. Is that correct? It's for any, and there's any of them ever. So even if you set one up in the future, uh, Kyle would have the opportunity to change that to able if he wants to. Well, he has, it, it's in our will. 
basically. Yeah. And that's my reference to that. But, you know, so there's really no money in there yet because the money will go in as part of his, the estate. So that money at that point in time could be put into the ABLE account, correct? Yes. And then on, with respect to the Medicaid reimbursement then, is it just those dollars or is it all the money in the ABLE account? Uh, all the money in the ABLE account. So if it's an existing ABLE account now that doesn't have trust money in it, that's now not subject to Medicaid reimbursement? Correct. Oh, okay, because that, that's interesting. Thank you. I. Yeah, it hasn't been signed yet, but I'm pretty sure she's going to sign it. So uh, I don't hold my time. breath with her. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the other question I have, and I'm sorry if I monopolized, but these are things that I think are, are significant. There were, I believe, in the House, some 60 some amendments to the guardianship conservatorship. Uh, language, which in many ways would push it back to the pre-reform measures. To be quite frank, it was the uh, probate lawyers that pushed this. I don't have to probably tell you. Um, kind of worked a little bit with Josie Gittler at the University of Iowa on that. What is the status of that? Because I can never find anything. Was it signed? Was it changed? What, what took place? Nope. Out of those, I don't know, 12 bills that they filed this year including the last one you mentioned none of them passed nothing well, good changed. i'll think i'll take that as a plus then because that would have been a huge mistake thank you for everything you do amy i really appreciate you answering my questions and i am going to hang around for a while yet too so <laughs> you know <laughs> well i appreciate everything you got you do bill so i know you're a great advocate um, hey, Amy, um, this is Brian. Can I uh, ask you a follow-up question on the, um, uh, and I may have written it down wrong, but the uh, the ordinance on looking at the housing towards voucher program. Um, so when, uh, as a person that used to work for uh, housing programs, there's definitely an over-representation of person with disabilities, older individuals, and persons of color who, who utilize those vouchers. So is there any thought to this being a discriminatory practice. I mean, this is Iowa, but we do have at least a few black and brown people here. So is there some concern that you're looking at a couple groups that all these groups have some protected status um, um, uh, designations here that this could be opening the floodgates on again for something that could be perceived as a discriminatory practice? Just this is where my head went. Yeah, definitely. I mean, all of the groups that represent the um, black and brown communities, the um, other other communities um, that, I don't wanna call them vulnerable communities. I think I heard frontline communities before. Um, they're all, they all opposed it. There was a huge number of groups that were opposing this change. And the landlords had some kind of outsized influence this year. I don't know if they spent a lot of money during the elections or what, but sure. this legislature is all about private property rights. And they are absolutely, they were appalled that the government would tell somebody who they can rent to and who they can't, which of course government does that. Um, <laughs> we, we have housing rights, so we already do that. Yeah. Um, now I know other other states have done a broader um, anti discrimination that would say source of any source of payment. Uh, this was specific to housing choice vouchers, but some states have passed things that you can't discriminate if your main source of income is social security or mm -hmm. um, you know disability, any, whatever it might be, they, they have a broader ban on that. But that um, is clearly not something our legislature is going to be interested in. Um, I think that anybody that feels like they were denied based on this sure, or anything else that's a protected status, um, I think the Civil Rights and Disability Rights Iowa and Civil Rights Commission are going to have a lot to to work on there, but the, the communities were Des Moines, Iowa City, and Marion. Mm -hmm. um, so 
those are the three communities that had passed those and definitely you know in johnson county landlords don't they want to rent to the rich college kids yep. not, you know anybody else so that's their <laughs> that's the issue there but sure. um, i think that's a good point i think it's something yeah. that, that i there are a lot of groups including healthcare organizations signed right. on opposed to it because housing is a major um uh uh indicator of health so. yeah exactly. safe and affordable housing is hugely uh correlated to being able to maintain your health especially with chronic health conditions and mm -hmm. if you take into it and we i think we all kind of process it the same way but when you remove the single biggest um uh housing subsidy program from access to, to individuals, you're forcing them to either live in unsafe, unstable, vulnerable housing or relocate. None of those are real viable, good options. So uh, I know I know we're, we're running along on your time here, but just that just, yeah. Um, yeah, so I won't go on a Brian rant here, but that's, this is really disheartening. Yeah, Brian, I think we're all feeling the same way. And that's exactly where I went when I heard about it, too. Um, yeah. I really thought the governor waited a really long time to sign that. So I really thought like month, month over almost two months. And I thought she was going to oppose it. They, she got a lot of emails on it and it didn't happen. So. <sighs> Any other questions or comments for Amy? Amy, thank you so, so much. I, I so love listening to you and Julie because you take all this information and, and sometimes very complex information and make it palatable. So um, I really appreciate it. And I, I really um, appreciate folks being able to ask questions and clarify as well. So. I hope well, no one else worries about that. If anybody has any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, I'll put my email in my chat. I also forgot I was supposed to make a plug for, I'm looking for my calendar right now. We have, some of you may have done our capital chats that we did with the DD Council where we just have an hour where we kind of give a quick update and then have open it up for discussions. And we're gonna to try to keep doing those throughout the summer because I think it's a good opportunity for advocates to have an issue to ask questions or maybe help figure out their framing. And of course this next one will be talking about all the changes. So it's, um, I'm looking it up, which it's um, June 4th is our next one at 11. And so um, you'll be able to, um, sign on to that. If you go to Infinite Iowa, there's a link um, on that um, in our current issue to sign up for that one. And then the July 9th, um, they're both Fridays at 11. So we'll have at least two more on the books and then we'll probably pick it up again closer to the fall after school gets back in and, and start that up again. So feel Thank free you. to join us or let others know. Thanks. I just want to give a plug that those are great. Um, I was just so impressed with it. And we can include the, um, the sign up information in our notes for folks as well. So thank you so, so much, Amy. Good to see you. I hope you have a restful, busy weekend. <laughs> um, I'm going to sleep today. So, <laughs> <laughs> no sleep for the dead, I believe is. To say you better, you have a busy weekend. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know on our schedule we have benefits planning network next, but I also know that Kirsten Lane um, has to jump off uh, at noon. And so if you guys don't mind, I'm going to have, she just has a very quick, Kirsten, are you on? I can't always see. Um, Kirsten, do you mind giving your update, um, your just your uh, partner update, because I know it's a fairly quick one, and then we'll go ahead and move it to the benefits. Is. Yes, let me um, share my screen. I well. <laughs> it's letting you right. 
I don't know. Yes, it is. Can you see my screen now? It's thinking, but yes. It's thinking? <laughs> yeah. It says Kristen Lane has started to share her screen, but that's it so far. <laughs> mm, and it says on my end, Kristen Lane is screen sharing, so. Is screen sharing. All right, well, I, I wonder if I should just go ahead and start talking and then and then if it catches up, because my screen share is really just um, notes to myself. So, um, it, it, and it gives visual, but um, it is, um, well, you all know it's been a rough year for all of us, including everybody in education. I've talked to so many teachers who, you know, are veteran teachers who have been around for years and years and years, and they have all said this is the toughest year they've ever had. And it's, um, I think that's been true for all of us across the board. Um, but in spite of that, we uh, continue on. And so um, the, I, there are just five things that I wanted to share with you about what's going on in the Department of Education. And um, the first one I've talked about here before, but it's the differentiated accountability for IDEA. And, and what that really is, is um, really, developing a um, focused inquiry based on data around our outcomes for kids. And so um, under IDEA, what we're required to do is really monitor how we write IEPs and to make sure that we're really being intentional in our planning around secondary transition issues. And what we're doing is really shifting that focus. We'll still be looking at quality IEP development, but shifting our focus to a focus on um, outcomes. So what's happening to our students after we leave? Because even if we write the best IEPs ever, if our kids aren't achieving the outcomes we want for them, which is education and employment and involvement in the community after they leave um, school, it doesn't matter how good those IEPs were. And so um, we're really working on connecting our work with ESSA, which is the every student, every student achieve secondary, gosh, every, every student, student succeeds. succeeds. Huh? Every student succeeds that. Gosh, thank you. Wow. I just get so used to calling it ESSA, but um, connecting our work with ESSA, which is the, um, the uh, act for all students. So really it's not, um, IDEA and students with disabilities in isolation, but really um, focusing on that connection to um, how we serve kids with disabilities um, along with um, the services we provide to all kids. Um, because of COVID, there's been an interruption in our data, which has um, really um, created an interruption in the work. Um, but we will continue with that work going forward. So that's yeah. something to watch for and something that I really do believe um, can make a difference in how we're providing services and how we're um, um, helping students to achieve. And speaking of achieve, so our the next big project that I've been involved with is called Achieve. It is our new um, IEP system. And we're looking at beginning to use that in November of this next school year. And people would say, why November? Because schools generally start things in July or August at the beginning of a school year. But we have um, our annual count for um, students with IEPs is in October. And um, there just was a concern about really being able to provide continuity with that work as well as achieve. And so, the chief system will be um, trained in the fall, in August. Um, so AEA staff and um, LEA staff across the state will receive training about how um, the system will work. Um, we're really focusing our training. Um, there's a technical side to it, but really on, again, effective practices. So um, not just you know, what box do you click on to fill out the IEP, but how do you develop? So there, there are different components and obviously the component I'm involved with is secondary transition. So how do we um, really develop a quality secondary transition IEP, IEP within the ACHIEVE system? Um, part of that work 
involved a lot of collaboration with folks from this group um, as we really built in as we when we sat down with stakeholders to talk about you know what's missing what do teachers need to improve their IEP development um, you know what we heard was that especially in a lot of our smaller rural schools teachers serve um, kids with a lot of diversity of needs. And so as they're transition planning, they don't always, you know, they might not have had a student with a significant disability for a number of years. And so um, when they are um, doing this transition planning, they might not remember, how do I make a referral? How do I um, connect with um, waiver services? How do I connect with HAB service, those kinds of things. So we have built in a whole bunch of supports um, and guidance within the system around how to connect kids. So hopefully um, teachers and families will be able to access that because we're going to uh, store all of that on our I3 system, which is a new system I shared with y'all, I think last year, but the I3 system is all things IDEA um, in Iowa and we'll have a secondary transition section that has all of these um, resources so that families can use them as well as um, IE, other IEP team members. Um, the Iowa Secondary Transition Learning Community was a little more quiet this year than it was last year, again, COVID related, um, but it's not gone, it's coming back. We're still continuing to look at how, what the needs are within um, the state around secondary transition so that we can provide. Um, webinars has been a main source of our um, support in the past, but really looking at maybe some more targeted, um, integrated kind of work with um, smaller groups. Um, also, I wanted to share with you a, a project that we worked on with the uh, USED this past year. Um, Judy Worth provided training to a group of paraprofessionals in both um, Great Prairie AEA and Green Hills AEA. Um, it was an optional thing that districts could um, offer to their paraprofessionals. We had about 20 folks involved. It was incredibly well received. Um, the comments and the discussions were so rich. Judy's just masterful at, at um, sharing and um, providing the information on a very real level for folks. So she just meets everybody right where they're at. And she, um, I think it was a 10 week series um, they met every Wednesday afternoon. They had projects and activities and, um, and it was really focused on um, meeting the educators or the paraprofessionals where they were in the, in the system. So if they were providing services in a school setting, but really with the intention of when they're out in the community. So they talked about um, job coaching and natural supports and social supports and um, it was just very, very good. And so we're, we're exploring how we might be able to continue with, um, with that project and how we might expand on that going forward. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to share with you is some focused work that, um, that we've begun um, with um, career technical education. Um, special education and voc rehab, really looking at, because we know that career technical education, um, folks who are concentrators, so they spend more than just like an isolated class here and there, but folks who are concentrators in career technical educators, whether they're special ed students, gen ed students, it doesn't matter. Students in career technical education are more likely to, um, number one, graduate, and number two, um, be employed after they leave um, school. So how can we do a better job of including kids with disabilities, whether they be kids with IEPs or kids in, with 504 plans, but how can we do a better job of intentionally including kids with disabilities in um, our CTE programs? And we are right now, um, really at a place where we're analyzing and um, trying to figure out what is the state of the state related to that. So what are our numbers? Who, you know, are there certain programs? Are there certain districts or regions? Are there certain places where kids are more involved or less involved? 
And then we're gonna go through a process of really identifying what are the barriers? What are the reasons for the numbers being what they are? And then um, come up with a plan for how to increase um, those outcomes. And we're really, really excited about that because um, again, one of our, uh, the predictors of success is inclusion, you know, so we're not separating kids out into separate programs. One of the predictors of success is work-based learning and where do you get the best work-based learning? You can get it from a special ed program, but you can also get it from an inclusive program in CTE. And so looking at how we can pull all of that evidence-based research that we know about what good programming looks like and, um, apply that to our CTE programs. And so that's my rundown. Did my screen ever show up? It didn't, darn it. I had this beautiful picture of a spring meadow with flowers and it was hard to read the, uh, the words anyway because of all the flowers, but it, as I said, it didn't really matter. It was just the markers of the five topics I wanted to touch on. So does anybody have questions for me? No, it doesn't. No, that doesn't look it. like. Okay. Great. That was an incredibly, incredibly fun and informative meeting today. It was a tough act to follow, but I uh, that a lot of good information from Julie and Amy and a lot of fun. Congrats to you, Scott Whitty. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to Benefits Planning Network. We're going to turn it over to Susie Paulson and Brian Dennis. Well, before we get started, Amy, I wanted to uh, uh, publicly lodge a complaint that we have been bumped. Um, I don't feel that I'm valued as a friend or I'm just messing with you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't fast enough, but I was trying to mute you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Many have tried, all have failed. So, um, okay, actually, sure. Thank you. And I will actually uh, leave this to Susie to kind of start us off here. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, you know, my name is Susie Paulson and I work for Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation as a resource manager for Social Security Benefits Planning. Um, total uh, individuals that we serve that are on social some kind of Social Security benefits is about 4,500 um, individuals across the state. Uh, we, uh, we also serve a, an additional 9,000 uh, students that are that pre-employed transition age that aren't actually on our caseloads um, that we also provide benefits counseling for. So we thought we'd start out, Brian and I talked yesterday, which is always fun, and I know how to mute him. Um, I just call him Batman and he kind of has to hide his identity. So uh, I think we started out with why is benefits planning important? And I, I think that all of you on here probably know that um, providing benefits counseling or not providing benefits counseling, not providing benefits counseling um, just creates an additional barrier to employment for individuals with disabilities. They're gonna stay poor. Um, there's a lot of things that we have difficulty um, answering succinctly because we don't control, you know, Brian at Workforce or Susie at Work Volk Rehab, we don't control what Social Security does or what the Department of Human Services does. And that's a critical piece um, that people will use as a, as a reason for not um, working, working at a higher level. Also, lots of misinformation that's out there um, that, that causes people to um, believe their neighbor or the person on the bus as opposed to something that they're told is Social Security. Because, you know, you could call three different Social Security people and get three different answers. Absolutely. So, so that's the tough piece. Um, Brian, you want to talk about a little bit about why benefits planning is important? Well, sure. So first off, we all know that um, for so many people, their benefits are integral to their survival. And 
Um, so for many people, they lean on their benefits. It's the money that they get through the day with, it's their insurance for their health care. They have lots of services and supports that may be billed through uh, their Medicaid. So benefits planning is really necessary to at least approach that initial first concern. These are completely valid concerns. You know, someone told me, hey, by doing this, you may have an impact in your money or your health insurance. And for people that are really familiar with struggle and all the hoops it takes you to get on benefits, that's the last thing I'm going to do. Uh, I may not be thriving, but I am surviving. And what you're telling me is you're selling me risk uh, uh, and everything is going to work out. There's nothing in my life experience has shown me that this is going to work out. Um, so that leads to a lot of concern. So benefits planning is really necessary to not only kind of uh, calm some of those very valid concerns, but just to open the door to really considering what is possible. Okay, so benefits planning really is our way of open the door to trying something new, because if you don't try something new, you, you, as Susie said, you will just stay poor. And not only will you stay poor, you will be some of the poorest of the poor. We're talking a lot of abject poverty. You know, you may have a roof on your head, but that's about it. Um, so the benefits planning piece, which again, I'm weird, I, I really like it, um, really begins to, uh, Susie, Susie likes it. So Susan and I are good examples of people who really enjoy benefits planners are always weird people. And I'm looking at Misty as well. Um, we, we are just that, we're just that crew. That is our tribe, that is our village, okay? But our tribe and our village is really here to help all of our share in workforce, we, we use the term customers, uh, to really help our shared customers. And it's really a great resource, not only for the recipient of the benefits, but just for the providers. And we know everyone is doing a million things and we live in a complicated world, even if there's not a pandemic. So the value of benefits planning is really to kind of untangle the knot to hopefully shine a light on the road to uh, economic self-sufficiency. That's trademark, nobody use that. Um, to really, again, start to give people opportunities to enhance their life. So that is the overall goal and benefit of it. And it's still a complicated journey, but it really, again, starts to maybe untwist that knot and show people things that may be possible. And believe it or not, Social Security wants people to work. Social Security wants people to be independent. Social Security wants people to uh, achieve more things. Now, they don't necessarily make that process easy, um, but that is completely doable with the benefits uh, benefits planning and some of the things that we're able to do through the network and really creating that net and that team around individuals to help them make those steps forward. So uh, the next question that we wanted to talk about was um, why there was a need for us to, we formed a new group, <laughs> one more group, but there was really a huge need for, for this is that um, there are a lot of us and like Brian said, Misty is on here, and there's several others. Um, there's a lot of CRPs now that have benefits counselors. Um, workforce development has benefits counselors. And there was just a need for all of us to come together as a group and to be kind of this united effort to get the information that we need. Because if we're all out there doing our little silo thing, mm -hmm. it, it's not helping anyone. And this way we can um, bat things around. We were really fortunate. Our second meeting, um, our area work incentive coordinator for social security out of Kansas City came. And I think she's gonna continue to um, attend it because she realizes that Part of the issue that we have as benefits counselors is getting the right information from Social Security. I, I, I don't have a caseload other than people that are on Social Security benefits. And like I said, there's like 4,500 of them. Um, but if I can't get that information from Social Security, I can't answer their questions accurately. And a lot of the information that we get from Social Security is not accurate. In fact, when somebody goes to work, they just assume that Social Security um, must know that they're working, right? Because they're paying taxes. But until Social Security does a work review on individuals that are on SSDI or Social Security Disability Insurance, it, they don't even actually apply it to the record. Even though they're sending in those pay stubs, they're not applying it to the record until that work activity review gets done. Um, so it's really been a good thing 
I think for us to be having a chance every month to talk about stuff, to figure out what's the best way for us to um, really apply some of these work incentives, because, you know, we've all gone through lots and lots of training. And we sit through lots and lots of meetings and it's all this stuff that's way up here and Brian and I have a pet peeve we agreed on higher level stuff, you know, for for job candidates that's just total. Crap, you can say it. Hogwash. <laughs> From the Ozarks. <laughs> Anyway, it, it just is. It's not. It doesn't help anybody. And so all of us getting together and talking these things out, you know, like what, how do you use the subsidy? How do you get Social Security to apply it? You know, how do you put that package together, send it all in at the same time and make sure that Social Security has what they need? We can do that for job candidates that we're serving. And so if I have a good system going on, I can share it with Brian or with Misty or they have a good system. That's why we think it's really important. Do, did you wanna talk a minute about that too, Brian, about um, the need for this network? Sure, so number one, um, the need for the network is this, and I'm gonna steal one from uh, for any of you that know Doug Keys. Uh, many hands make light work. And it's the idea of that if you, um, and if anyone tells Doug I said anything nice about him, he, uh, I'm going to deny it. Um, but truthfully, the reason that the network exists is number one, I, I was kind of being a bit uh, sarcastic when I talked about benefits planners are weird, but benefits planning, helping individuals is heavy lifting. It really is. And so um, if anyone's ever dealt with it, the idea that and when I do training, I like to say social, I like to say social security has a really big butt. And the reason that I use that is that for all of our knowledge and training and best efforts, there's still going to be something strange that may go on. And the idea that with our benefits planning network, you have a group of subject matter experts who are still going to have their corner of the sky of even more specified expertise. You're going to have someone that you can go to with that problem. So when I get a benefits planning question that I'm not sure of, I can quickly, I have a network of people that I can run through things. We have the ability to have resources like our benefits, like our calculators. We can post different types of resources that for those of us that are benefits planners, we have our network, but also for those of you that this isn't something that is your love of loves uh so maybe you are better socialized people than Susie and i uh you can find resources you can find help and again and we can all work together to support people because again i just know for me doing this for quite a while now um one of the great joys i have in doing this work is when people realize wow i don't have to stay poor i don't have to limit myself um, I can buy a house. I can, I can, you know, I don't, I can transfer off of things. I don't have to rely on all these benefits or I can maintain the benefits that I need. Um, that it's not an either or situation. So there's a lot of that that comes with the network and the things we're able to do as a team and resources we can have available to um, the larger community. And again, we all invite you to be a part of that network, whether again, this is your favorite thing, you just wanna maybe learn one thing where it's a little less mysterious to you. So one of the things that I've been doing at Voc Rehab is I do a lot of training. I do weekly training. They're called micro training. I do monthly uh, benefit planning 101, it takes about an hour and a half. I do a quarterly past training, um, as well as serving individuals that have specific needs and questions. But I also uh, don't care who comes to my training. You know, that's, you get on my list and you'll get the message about the training. So um, that's the other thing I think with uh, with the freedom in my job that I'm able to do. And I especially encourage the community rehab providers to join because a lot of information gets, you're directly working with that individual. And they can get bad information from you based on something that you had in the past happen or numbers that you knew in the past. And, it, you know, that's why it's really important to stay up to date. So I hope that if you're interested in that, you can send me an email about wanting to be on that list for the Iowa uh, Benefit Planning Network. The other piece is the website. Um, 
you all remember Paige and she has a new last name and I don't know it. So I'm not going to try to say it used to be Paige Easton and she got a grant and was able to pull together a, a website at IWD. Well, that website now is um, at Iowa Voc Rehab, uh, me, I guess. And the calculators on there are up to date. Everything else is not, but we're trying to create some things um, that illustrate and provide, you know, the work incentives and then also illustrate the um, the different things that individuals want to know, the information that people want to know. So one of the things I started about a year ago um, at the beginning of the pandemic was, um, you know, I've gone to a lot of transition um, training since or transition nights um, all over the state since I came back to Voc Rehab in February 2019. And there's been very few people there. And I sit there and I think, well, I know exactly why they're not here. You have no idea what it's like to have a child that has a significant disability and they have their way and you're going to go out in the evening, really. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, it gets uh, tricky. And so it made sense everybody's virtual anyway, let's start these parent nights. So we started meeting every month and we had specific topics and it grew and grew and grew. And then by fall, I got to the point where I thought, well, you know, I know for me, when I have the question, I have the question now, and I'm not going to wait a year before they talk about guardianship again, I need the answer to the question now. So I decided to set up a little bit different format, where when the parents come on, uh, it's one, it's the second Thursday of every month, when the parents come on, there's a poll, they can pick what questions, what category they have questions in, and the categories are guardianship, that's a huge one guardianship, conservatorship, um, anything SSA related, social security, um, Medicaid waivers, all that stuff, and then any other uh, questions that people might have. Um, so I, we went that way and it just seems to be really working out well. We only meet for an hour, different parents show up every time. Um, then I, I really, the guardianship questions get go beyond what my expertise says, right? So I talked to Jennifer Donovan. Some of you might know her. She is with the Office of Guardianship and Substitute Decision Making at the Iowa Department on Aging, and she loves transition aid kids. That's kind of her thing. And so I said, hey, if you could just like come every month <laughs> And you can answer all the guardianship questions. And so this last week when we met, there's about 18 families. And as she started talking, answering the first question, I thought, I got to record this. I have been not recording any of these because, you know, the privacy of the parents. But I got this idea of recording it, recording her answer, recording me asking the question, um, put it all into YouTube and I'm on question number nine now there's 20 questions and it's wonderful so parents when I send out the links parents can just click on it whatever their question is and there they've got the answer from a, 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 a lawyer so it's a pretty exciting um, the way it's turning out it's it's looking really exciting and I think those resources would also be on the website so if you don't know what website I'm talking about it's disabilitybenefits.iowa.gov and it's, um, thank you for clarifying. Oh, did you have a question? Sorry. Anyway, Brian, do you wanna wrap this up? I think, or do we have more to talk about? I think that covers the high points that we wanted to cover. So um, are there any questions? And I was definitely getting ready to type in the chat the uh the website but um it, does anyone have any questions about the network about the value of the, i'm sure um um but about the network um any particular things that you want to ask us again we are here even though amy bumped us oh. um but and, yeah does there any questions and, and i have to um so you talked about the three hundred thousand dollars that voc rehab received in addition to our regular budget this year um which allows us to draw down I'm not even sure. It's like several million dollars, I think, from the federal government. But what the money is for is three FTEs that are specifically focused on individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, the rest of it is, is a juvenile services reentry program. Dave just left. I didn't know what the other thing was. So Dave just 
answered my email. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that's what the additional funding is going to be able to um, help us do. Thank you so much, you guys. And thank you, Brian, for putting that in the chat. And we'll make sure that we also include it in notes. Um, and if folks wanted to um, get on Susie's mailing list, um, is it okay, Susie, if we just put your email in there and have folks reach out to you for that? And um, folks are always welcome if they don't remember to reach out to us and we can connect them. I know Misty, you had asked if if people have an interest, you know, can, do we, you know, are we kind of in a position to be able to kind of help folks? So um, get connected and the both the benefits planning network as well as um, the work that that Susie is doing and offering to a wider audience than VR, both for parents and families, um, as well as for uh, just some of the benefits planning training is wonderful for folks. So we'll be sure to share that and um, encourage you to share it with others who might be interested as well. And, and I just had to do one more quote by Doug Keast. Um, the one that I was thinking Brian was gonna say was a high tide lifts all boats. And that was something that John F. Kennedy said, I guess. And I think that's kind of what we what we want to accomplish through this network Absolutely. is is that and, and that's why I wanted my trainings to be open to anybody that wanted to show up. I'm not taking roll call. You know, somebody sent me an email today and said, um, do the parents do their does their student have to already be a VR client? And you know, that I I no, I I don't think that's important. Um, I think what's important is people need the information. And do they have to be like under 24? No. If they have a question, they should be able to ask. Mm -hmm. We need to get practical, hands-on information to people, not just talking about guardianship, but, you know, the hardest thing is where do I get a lawyer and how do I get on the judicial site? And once I get on there, is it a civil or a probate or there's too many options and I don't know. And that frustrates parents. They just want to do it, get it done and be over it. And, and it seems like as professionals, sometimes what we do is we talk about everything. Like I said, me and Brian's pet peeve, that that high, high level. level. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't really help the parents. No. No. Great. Thank you guys so, so much. Sorry about bumping you. <laughs> no worries no worries at all um I, I know that we're running a little um a little bit short on time so we still have our partner updates um to to get through as well as um we're gonna let scott wrap up the meeting um at the end it, he'd like to share a few words as well so um moskowitz I'm going to, I think you probably have the longest uh, or the most information to share. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Leanne. Thank you. All right. I'll try and keep it quick. Um, I sent the uh, update to Amy this morning, as well as the um, employment data for July and October of 2020. Um, so she can share that all with you. So I won't kind of, I won't dig in the weeds. I'll kind of keep it high level today. So, um, I'm sorry, I was just going to say they're all in the folder on the Google Drive that I that we put in the chat box if folks want to download them as Leanne's talking. Go ahead. So um, COVID-19, you know, we still have, and maybe I should share my screen. Let me share my screen here. Doo -doo -doo. Not that one, maybe this one. <laughs> so y'all, can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Good deal. Um, so COVID-19, we have our uh, DHS resource, of course. The previous uh, meeting, I gave you the individual links for providers, members, et cetera. So if you want that information, you can go back and look at the, the I think, a January or February meeting. Um, CMS flexibilities. So um, the department is continuing to review the flexibilities that were granted by 
um, CMS due to the public health emergencies. There were a number of flexibilities, you'll recall, that were granted. And so we're reviewing those to determine whether or not um, folks access them and whether or not there's a need to continue those flexibilities um, beyond the conclusion of the, the public health emergency. Um, continuous eligibility. So CMS has instructed states to start to unwind um, continuous Medicaid eligibility requirement. And so what this means for members who are receiving LTSS who were determined at some point in time during the public health emergency to no longer meet um, eligibility, um, either due to not meeting um, level of care, not meeting the needs-based eligibility criteria, not meeting the income requirements, um, or other, um, you know, they aged out of the program, um, but were continued due to the continuous eligibility requirement on the public health emergency and our commitment to ensure that people maintain their coverage during the public health emergency. Um, we kept these folks on the programs that they were determined to no longer be eligible for. And so we are going to start um, unwinding those flexibilities. Members who um, were determined ineligible for LTSS during the public health emergency will receive a letter from the department. And when I'm talking about long-term services and supports, I'm talking about home and community-based uh, services programs, which would include the um, HCBS waivers, the state plan HCBS habilitation program, our PACE programs, um, our LTSS programs that are not in the long-term care facilities. Um, so if DHS determines that the member no longer meets the eligibility um, or level of care for the LTSS program that they're currently on, uh, they'll receive a notice of decision in the mail and it will tell them that their current LTSS coverage will end along with the effective date of when that will end um, however, if the LTSS coverage ends, the member will maintain Medicaid eligibility for the duration of the federal public health emergency. And so um, right now, it's my understanding that the federal public health emergency has, you know, has been extended again, of course, and so we continue to watch that. Um, there's a link to the informational letter here. Um, direct link that'll take you out to the informational letter that has more information about our eligibility um, phases unwind. And so what I recommend is when a member gets their, um, and this will happen probably um, beginning uh, at the end of June um, into July for an August 1st effective date. So, um, you know, August 1st would likely be the, the first time, first date that members would no longer be covered under LTSS if they weren't otherwise eligible. Um, but if a member does receive a notice of decision, um, I recommend that they appeal. Um, if the member uh, appeals, we'll go back and we will um, do redetermination in regards to um, level of care, et cetera, whatever's appropriate. So um, again, People should be opening their mail, <laughs> and those letters uh, will be going out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, legislative reports, I give you the link to that. Um, the American Recovery Plan um, Act, we've been looking at this, and this is going to be um, a great opportunity for states to really um, bring some life into the HCBS programs and do some innovative things to um, help strengthen, enhance, and improve our, our HCBS program. And so um, CMS has uh, issued a state Medicaid director letter 21003 um, in response to uh, the section 918 of the American Recovery Plan Act that gives an temporary enhanced 10% F map um, for qualifying HCBS expenditures that occur between the period of April 1st, 2021 and March 31st of 2022. States will have until 2024 to expend those additional funds that are drawn down by the enhanced FMAP. Um, states are required to develop a spending plan and spending narrative that describes um, how they'll spend the funds, the activities, 
um, timelines and things like that. Um, there has not been a specific preprint issued by CMS for this. Um, so states can use their own format on how they wanna provide that information to CMS. So um, those spending plans and narratives are due to CMS by June 11th. And CMS will review the state's um, spending plan and narrative and approve it or request recommend uh, changes or, or um, edits. And then the state would then uh, be required to submit a quarterly um, spending plan and narrative every quarter thereafter. Um, and then CMS intends to publicly post information um, reported by the states and how states are using the ARPA funds. So um, possible activities um, for the ARPA funds, and this is not an exhaustive list. There may be other things that CMS um, would be willing to review and approve the use of those funds, but it could include rate uh, increases, reducing wait lists, um, leave benefits for direct support professionals, specialized payments, um, PPE and testing supplies, uh, initiatives or activities that are um, targeted at workforce recruitment, workforce training, workforce retention, um, supports for family caregivers, assistive technology, maybe assistance with um, one-time transition costs and the coordination of transitions, uh, rehabilitative type of services, expanding capacity um, to serve members, education materials, language assistance, and then supports um, for individuals with HCBS needs and their caregivers. We have received quite a bit of feedback from um, provider associations and other stakeholders throughout the state on recommendations to use those um, ARPA funds. And so the policy team at IME has developed um, our, our top 11 or 12, I guess, um, recommendations for the use of those funds and, and have um, looked at uh, what the contingencies are, dependencies, does it support our, our DHS goals, does it support the governor's goals, um, and does it overall help improve, enhance, or strengthen um, the HCBS program, and ultimately uh, the quality of care and services that members in the HCBS uh, services are receiving. So lots of work going on around that, and I um, wanted to bring your attention to House File 891. This is on the governor's desk. It brings exciting news um, for HCBS folks. And so um, I know that uh, Amy already covered this information. And so um, just know that um, barring any line item vetoes, it looks like that our HCBS providers will be receiving a rate increase um, effective July 1. Um, this also, the funding in that bill also enables us to um, lift the rates of the home-based habilitation services um, and base those services on the acuity score that will be derived from the LOCUS and Cal LOCUS assessment tools that we'll be adopting for that program. So we're super excited about that. Um, it also includes uh, dollars, of course, as I said, for the HCBS um, waiver providers. And there's also an increase to lift the PMIC rates. I believe that 3.9 million um, will lift the daily per diem to 275 for those PMICs. And so uh, there's also money for waitlist buy down for children's mental health waiver. I don't remember the exact number that 1.31 will buy down, but I believe it's right around 400 um, funding slots. If you recall a couple of years ago, the um, legislature appropriated $2 million to buy down the CMH waiver wait list. And with that money, we were able to buy down about 864 slots. So I'm, I'm guessing right around 400. I haven't seen the, the most up-to-date um, number from our fiscal agent. So um, policy changes, state plan amendments, again, lots of stuff going on. We were not um, sitting idle during COVID, let me tell you. Um, so the ID waiver and state plan habilitation day have rules went into effect February 1st. And so um, really uh, excited that, that um, we were able to clarify that day have can provide a pathway to employment. It does not replace employment services um, either delivered through supported employment or delivered through um, vocational rehab. It is not an employment service but is intended to 
hopefully spark interest in employment and uh, potentially create relationships through the activities that people are participating in that could be leveraged and lead to potential employment for folks. So um, again, we're, we're excited about that. Again, trying to push our community integration um, efforts forward. Uh, the habilitation, um, individual placement and support, um, supported employment rules uh, were published out for public comment in the Administrative Rules Bulletin on May 19th. I gave you a direct link to that. Um, public comments must be submitted to uh, the department by June 8th, 2021. Our estimated effective date, and, and again, this is all kind of timing on how we get back before the rules committee and things like that. So uh, the earliest will be September 1st. It may be more like October 1st, but I'm you know, being cautiously optimistic. Again, uh, just a reminder, this um, implements the provider qualifications and standards required to deliver the IPS service to Fidelity. It also um, details the service uh, standards and outcomes, as well as the outcome um, reimbursement uh, methodology. Uh, as you recall, we're currently um, for, uh, 43 North Iowa and Hope Haven Rock Valley are delivering those services through an exception to policy to enable payment through Medicaid, these rules will ensure that they no longer require an exception to policy and that we're able to um, you know, monitor, oversee, and, and properly reimburse providers who want to come after them uh, and stand up IPS teams themselves. So we're super excited about that. And we have the Aspire project that Lynn Nibling over at MHDS um, is uh, spearheading for us that will bring us the um, technical assistance and support and subject matter experts um, to help us uh, stand up uh, additional IPS teams in Iowa. So we're, we're super excited about that. We believe that we have the, um, uh, the ability to uh, bring on an IPS uh, reviewer and trainer uh, before um, September and so uh, we're hopeful that's going forward and uh, we'll get somebody hired uh, and in place um, this fall. Hopefully everything kind of coincides together uh, timing wise. Then we have the habilitation eligibility and home-based tab rules. Um, the rules will be public, uh, published for public comment. I'm guessing in June, um, maybe a little quicker. We'll see how things shake out in the next couple of weeks, but um, House File 891 uh, grants emergency rulemaking authority to implement that um, rate change for home-based habilitation. And these rules um, are what uh, redefine home-based habilitation and redefine the eligibility for home-based habilitation to be based on the composite um, score derived, or I should say final disposition score derived um, from the LOCUS and Cal LOCUS uh, assessment tools. So we're really excited about that um, and, and hope we can keep uh, chugging right, right along. Uh, the work groups put a lot of time and effort into this in the past year and it's really great to, to see it about to come to fruition. Then we have the EVV electronic visit verification. Those uh, rules are out for public comment in the May 5th administrative rule bulletin. Um, so I didn't put the date in here that public comment was due, I apologize. So the public comment uh, for this will be due, I'm guessing right around um, June uh, 5th, it's 30 days public notice. And so EVV is used for those um, consumer directed attendant care services and homemaker services right now. Um, and it's intended to, you know, it'll record the start and end time of those services. Uh, it'll ensure that members are receiving the services that are in the service plan, and if they're not, it will call our attention to it so that we can ensure uh, that that gets addressed properly and that member are, members are not going without care. Um, and it also um, will help us ensure quality and, and program integrity. So uh, that's out for public comment right now. As you're all aware, um, EVB uh, must be implemented by July 1st. And there's uh, training sessions that have been going on. There's an informational bulletin out there on um, our informational bulletin uh, webpage uh, that talks about the dates and times for that EVB training with CareBridge on how to use the system. 
So uh, changing the length of institutional stay to request a reserve capacity slot um, to close that gap from six months to four months of institutional stay was out for public comment on April 7th. Um, that comment period is closed. We didn't get any comments. And so those will likely go back through the rules committee, I believe the first um, meeting in June. Hopefully I have that right. And then we'll be looking at probably a um, August 1st uh, implementation date for that. CMS did approve the amendment for the waivers effective um, April 1st. Removal of the age limit for IMMT. This is one of our goals. Um, this is one of the recommendations that the team put forward also is use of ARPA funds. You know, we have a, it's just a small group of people that access this service in um, state fiscal 21. Um, however, it can be a very um, expensive service. And so, uh, but we do think that it um, can result in a cost savings when people are able to get that medical monitoring and treatment in the home and, and uh, kind of be diverted from more expensive, more costly um, type of services, such as 24 hour nursing, that kind of thing. So uh, we, we think that um, we can show that it will actually be budget neutral or actually effectuate a savings. So um, I think uh, the policy team is committed to moving forward with that. And so we'll get the rules um, going and, and get the fiscal impact done and so we can uh, Get that changed. Uh, we do have, we do grant a number of exceptions to policy each year um, for folks to stay on IMMT past the age of 21. Um, there were 12 such individuals that accessed that service through an ETP last year. Um, provider manual um, is updated, it's posted online. Uh, this is the link for the bulletins that I was just referring to. So if you click on that, it'll take you out to the um, informational bulletin page. You can do a search by subject, search by provider type, um, that type of thing for the uh, informational letters. So last but not least, I feel like I'm getting winded here. Um, employment data for 2020, um, COVID was 19 was just really hard all around on everybody as, as we've heard time and time again. Um, it did have an impact on wages, hours and earnings. Um, the, and I have a see a typo there in my thing, large the largest impact seen with the HAB members um, competitively employed dropping from 12% of enrollees to 6.3%. So 50% drop in competitive and employment. But it kind of makes sense when you think about COVID and all the anxiety and everything that was going on and perhaps how folks with um, uh, chronic mental illness uh, reacted to the to the um, public health emergency and, and the impact that we saw on employment for that. Um, ID waiver saw a slight increase in those competitively employed up to 17.93%. Um, the ID waiver has the um, highest number of members who are competitively employed out of the three programs. Um, the IME did discover during this last round looking at the member level data um, that we need to do some more um, refining of the employment data metrics to ensure that we're not counting members um, in the hours, wages, and earnings who are competitively employed, but for whatever reason during the two week um, reporting period did not have wages, hours, or earnings because we think what's happening is those people are little data and it's artificially deflating um, wages and hours and earnings. And so we're going back and we're looking at those matrix and we're gonna tweak them a little bit so that um, those people are included in the account of folks competitively employed, but if they didn't have any wages, earnings or hours during that two week review period that they're not included in the data. And so I think that'll give us a little bit better day and I think that'll improve our hours, wages and earnings in the next reporting period. Um, we do still show that we've got some members earning as little as a dollar an hour out there still, um, which, you know, hopefully we'll see some progress on that in this next year and, and as people want to get back to work. And, and, you know, we know we've got employers all over the state just screaming for folks and, and how can we leverage that and really help people connect with those folks who are looking for employees. Um, and so we're also going to be conducting an employment deep dive 
Uh, we are going to um, pull all of the claims data for employment and uh, day habilitation services back to the beginning of employment service redesign. So June 1st of 2016 or state fiscal 17. And we're going to be looking at the data across the years up through state fiscal 21. And we're going to be trying to um, tell some stories about where people were and how they've moved through the system. We have the member level data so we can look at folks and say, okay, of those people who had you know, pre-vote authorized in 2016, where are they now? Or where were they, where did they move to? Did they go to DAHAB? Did they go to supported employment? Did, did they just drop out of the data altogether? And what does that say to us um, kind of thing? So we're hoping to be able to really um, tell some stories about how people move through services, um, day programming and employment services. Uh, with that deep dive. So we've got the data. Now we've got to play with it. So that's it. Questions? Sorry. <laughs> Tried to talk as fast as I could. I know I may have talk, talked a little bit too fast for some folks, and I apologize for that. Such good information, Leanne, and I'm sorry that you had to be rushed. Um, no problem. So rich and like everything on this list we could spend a lot of time unpacking i think so next yeah. meeting we're going to have you go first <laughs> um, i know we're getting really close to our ending time i didn't know vienna if you had anything you wanted to give an update on um we can also put something in the notes too if you it's up to you and then we're going to turn it over to scott you know what i'll just put um the information session that we're going to be having on customized discovery that we will be doing on March 27th and would love to invite everyone on here to come and learn about um, what customized discovery is going to be that uh, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation is going to be offering starting October 1st of this year and the current discovery program that we have on our menu of services is going to end the end of September. So um, that's all that I will say and um, I'll, I'll put it in the chat and you can take it on. I'm sorry, Vienna. That's okay. Scott, I can't think of a better way to end our meeting. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and I just want to thank everybody for their time today. Well, th thanks for, for sharing some time. But if those of you that heard my wife talk earlier, oftentimes I, it takes me a while to, uh, get my thoughts in order enough to speak. So I took the time to, to make some notes here that'll help me keep this to a minimum. But so three, three key things uh, that, that I attribute uh, Hope Haven's success to and, and, and thus my own success. And first and foremost are, are the partnerships. And this, this group, this IC group has been a key piece uh, to, to our success. Uh, Employment First and, and ODEP at the national level, uh, IME and the MCOs, folk rehab certainly, uh, regions, uh, APSI at, at both the state and national levels, those have all been key to us and and the the way i've always viewed partnerships uh which i learned from my my mentor and and boss of 30 years david vinning and is that that once you have those relationships and partnerships you make you make use of them uh as resources and and that that gets you at the table to to a whole realm of of opportunities, and, and that's what has been, I think, so so key to to um, to our work and and our success. So thank thanks to all of you guys for for being a part of that uh, for us here at Hope Haven. Uh, so we underwent a, a 
big organizational shift here, as Amy said, around the time that we were introduced to IC. And one of the, the things that, that I've held uh, as, as a mantra uh, over my years of experience in management and in administration is pretty simple, hire people smarter than you are, you know? And, and fortunately, I, I, I found the people smarter than me to, to head up this effort. And uh, I, I look for hiring strong leaders uh, with passion and energy. And for, for me, the, the true champions of of the effort here at Hope Haven have been Tony Teese, um, who, who when I hired her, she was a, a two person department and, and we now have close to 35 staff delivering supported employment services. So shortly after Tony started growing things, she, she needed an assistant and that was Rachel Phipps. And since then, Tony, Rachel, and the development of their staff have, have led to, through the seven year anniversary of My Choice Employment, we had helped 355 people uh, obtain competitive employment it, in over 280 businesses in Northwest Iowa and 33 different communities. And I just give all the credit in the world um, to Tony and Rachel um, and, and their staff. Thank you guys. And, and that took a huge culture shift in how we interacted and viewed employers. And, and that's just been incredible to see when Larry Boovey and I were and David, we're thinking of this eight, nine years ago, that, that was one of our biggest fears. How, how are we gonna find enough employers? And uh, they made it work. So, um, and, and then I want to, before we leave, I wanna introduce the, the new director of employment, uh, services at Hope Haven, Michaela Simmons, who will be taking over here uh, full time in a couple of weeks. So Michaela will, will be, continue to be invested in, in IC and Employment First and all of those good things. So thanks again, you guys, appreciate it. I, I gotta get to eating this bread pudding while it's still hot. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. See you soon, Scott. Yep. <laughs> Scott. Goodbye.